Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Can I give you the most important word that I can give you from a personal basis today? Can I share with you the most important word in my vocabulary as it relates to Debbie and me? Thank you. That was the word. The word was, thank you. You see, over the years, this church has been generous to Debbie and I. Just a couple, oh, maybe six months, six, eight months ago, Pastor Ryan was so kind to, to help us with our ministry. And what was just said in terms of helping mi missionaries, let me, let me kind of put it in a perspective. I'll do it in the context of what Debbie and I do in terms of our work. Uh, we do work all across the Caribbean. We work all across uh, Latin America, from Mexico all the way to the, to the uh, borders and inclusive of Argentina. And we work at the graduate level and the undergraduate level. We're missionary educators. And here's how our system works. Uh, I will, in fact, the 15th, in, in two weeks, I think it is, uh, from yesterday, I will be on a plane and I will be flying to Argentina. And I will be there for one week. You see, we live in, Debbie and I live in, in Springfield, Missouri, but we travel in and out of these countries. And as we do that, we, I, I, I fly into, and I'll fly into Buenos Aires. I will arrive on uh, late Saturday, and I will then proceed to uh, get ready for class on, on Sunday. Monday, I will start class. I will teach five days, six hours every day. I will be working with my students, and those students are, are amazing men and women. Let me tell you about one of them. Uh, no offense to those who are just starting out as I, as I point out what I'm about to point out. Uh, at the, in the English side of my work, I work mainly with undergraduates, but with the other side, I work with men and women who have been in the ministry 10, 15, 20 years. These are men and women who are Bible school directors. These are men and women who are national superintendents and district leaders. These are men, well, let me tell you, I was about to tell you about a, one, one of them. Uh, he is a pastor, he's a presbyter, and he oversees 90 churches. 90 churches are under his leadership and influence. That's amazing, but what's really amazing is that that pastor has pioneered 45 of those churches from nothing and then built the buildings. That's the kind of students that I have. And they're the kind of students that we're, we're, we're sharing. And the, the ministry in which I'm, I'm involved, primarily I'm teaching courses on the Holy Spirit, courses on, on the works of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, etc. And it is exciting to watch as these men and women that are, 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 are clearly touched and filled with the Spirit, clearly des desirous to see the Spirit work in their lives and in their churches, uh, in Argentina alone, I've, if I recall the number, I think it's roughly the students that I had last time I was there, uh, they represented about 25,000 people that they minister to. Now let me go back to my thank you for a minute. You see, Debbie and I, many, many moons ago, uh, close to, what, 40? About 40 years ago, we started when we were five. You agree, right? Yeah, thank you. You identify, right? <laughs> and we were in a church in New England as associate pastors. And if, if we could, I would take you to that building. I would take you to that very place where we sense God calling us to missions. Now, I want to point something out to you. We have a calling in our lives to serve internationally. But without you, we would still be in that church in that spot saying we have a calling. Your giving, your prayers, your support creates the transitional moment that takes a calling and moves it into a ministry. That's how important you are to what we do. And someday, speaking of thank you, someday you're going to be in heaven. And those of you who are not bilingual uh, in 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 in, in in Spanish, you'll be standing there and we'll all be in front of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we'll be worshiping and 
someone's going to come up to you and they're going to stand beside you and they're going to say, gracias. Who are you? Well, let me tell you who I am. That, 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 that pastor that oversees 90 churches, well, one of the churches that he oversees, I, got, I, I was one to Jesus and led to Jesus through the ministry of that church. And that pastor was influenced by that missionary who taught him. And because that uh, pastor or that missionary taught him, gave him new concepts and, and more skill with which to minister, he impacted my pastor who impacted the church who impacted me. I stand here and say thank you because you gave and made that missionary available to the field. See, folks, that's how real it is. That's how dynamic it is. It's not just an ethereal thing. It's a real thing. And so as I, as I land there, I will teach those, those, those classes and I'll be teaching again on the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I'm going to ask you, uh, I have with me and we have them in the foyer, uh, prayer cards. You're familiar with prayer cards. This one's a bookmark. Take it with you if you will. Please take one. We need your prayers. You see, what's happening is this. As I've been asking churches to pray, and I've been saying, will you pray? The week before I go, pastor will get an email just like everybody else does that says, I want you to pray. We're asking God that his Holy Spirit would, would manifest himself in the midst of the classroom. And we're seeing amazing things happening. We're seeing our students who, who I just described one of them and they're all that caliber of leadership and they're there and by Tuesday afternoon, they are weeping before the Lord saying, God, just visit us one more time in this country. God, just one more time, visit my ministry that I can impact this country, that this country can find itself in a revival. And that's in any country that I've been in teaching. Now, we understand I'm not trying to be egocentric or egotistical. I'm simply saying I can't do it without your prayers and it can't happen without your prayers and it won't happen except that God does it. I just happen to be the vessel. I just happen to be the vessel. We, we were in a church a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Pastor, you'll, you'll get a chuckle out of this. Uh, a little, little guy about nine years old was walking out in the foyer. And I said, would you like a prayer card? And he looked at me like I was kind of strange. And uh, I said, well, here, here, let me tell you, explain it. I said, take it and put it in your room. If you ever come across it again, you just simply say, God help that guy, he needs it. <laughs> and the little guy said, yeah, you probably do. <laughs> would you take that and put it somewhere and will you say God help that guy he needs it because he does I sure would appreciate that pastor thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share today and to allow me to, to be a part of what's happening in, in, in the, the service uh, and, and, and your ministry right now in terms of your, your theme that you're preaching on. And today, uh, I'm going to be sharing on the theme of effective parenting, skillful parenting. And we're going to go into uh, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, we're not going to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 today because it's a lot of verses and it would take most of the time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk us through those verses in a, in a highlight fashion with some pictures. And as I do, the pictures are there to be illustrative of what God wants to do. Now, as we, as we set the stage, let me, let me set the stage. Let's go, to the, let's go to that first slide real quick. We are all created in God's image, every one of us. You notice this picture? What's Mickey doing? He's looking in a mirror, and as he's looking in a mirror, he's drawing a picture of himself. You say, wait a minute, that's Walt Disney. Precisely. It's the image of his creator that he sees. You and I are created in that image of God. Now, if we are created in the image of God, then who should we look like? It's, it's a no-brainer. How should we act? How should we respond? How should we interact? Like our creator. 
And so as we look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we're going to see some principles that the creator demonstrated, that God himself demonstrated to humanity as he created all that he did in those first three chapters. He he created a, a, us in his image, and he did some pretty cool things to help us. So let's take a look at them. Let's go to the next one. And, and uh, yeah, we'll bring it up, and I'll talk to you a little, bit, a little bit about it, and then we can drop the slide down so we can get the projector back up, if that's okay, Pastor. God gave them a home that he created for them so that they could succeed. As you look at those passages in Genesis 1, 1, 1, and Genesis 2, 8, and 9, you will find that God created the garden to give them success. He placed everything in the garden to perfection. Food, air, think about this. Your lungs need an exact amount of oxygen, nitrogen, etc. to breathe for your body to live. When he created the garden, when he created the planet, he did it in such a way so that we could successfully breathe. God did everything in creation in preparation for his greatest of creations, you and me, humanity. If you notice the picture that was up there, you saw the, the picture of their, their, my kids when they were young. And it was a picture of the two of them with their, can we just flip it on just for a split second, guys? Uh, you'll notice that they're, they're, they're violinists. You see, without any negativity in, uh, intended, our income is not of such that we could write checks to send our kids to college. We couldn't. So what we determined was we would find ways that they could find a way to go to college. Those violins gave our son a full scholarship, gave our daughter a half scholarship. You see, we found a way that was in their wheelhouse, that was in their interests, so that as they were trained and developed on their violins, when they walked into to the university that they attended, they were able to do so, and they were able to find a way to be successful. To the point where our son ended up in ministry, music ministry in the church to start, and now he is a lead pastor in a church in Boston. And all of that came out of creating avenues for them to succeed. God creates for us ways to succeed. If we live in that image, we will create ways for our kids to succeed. Let's go to the next slide. Teach them that work is honorable. When God created the, the, the planet, when he put them in the garden, he said to, to subdue it, to take care of it, to watch over it, and all of that. He gave them assignments. They just didn't sit in the garden like this and say, ooh, I think I'll have a pair. And no, God gave them work to accomplish. Work actually came. Work is not a dirty word. It's, it's a four-letter word, but it's not a dirty word. And work is designed to help us to have self-worth. And God understood that. And so as our daughter here in this picture, she's in Jamaica and we were ministering there. We were there for four years and uh, Irving D. Clown, a, a, a great ministry, uh, if you've ever heard of him, Kevin Ross, uh, he was there with us and that's our daughter when she was about 14, ministering with him. Her work at that time, besides her schoolwork, by the way, her schoolwork, teaching her work is, uh, is uh, honorable. She caught the principles so well that literally when she would come home, her, when we moved to Jamaica, she was in seventh grade. When she, when she started school, she had 32 textbooks in Jamaica. When she came home from school, we used to have to tell her, Renee, one hour, no homework. You caught that right. One hour, no homework. Because otherwise she'd just keep working because she loved it. She saw value in it. She was excited about it. Now, please, I'm not setting neither Debbie nor I nor our kids up as the epitome. 
I just happen to be talking about some good things that happened in our lives. I could also talk about some of the things that didn't happen so good, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But as we, as we understand that work is honorable, we have to teach our kids that work is honorable. Because it will give them a sense of accomplishment. It will give them a sense of focus. It will give them a sense of self-discipline. It will give them a sense of, of, of good. What else did God do? He created the garden. He made it so they could succeed. He helped them to understand that in, 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 in following his plan, in, 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 a, in a good work ethic, that there was value. What else did he do? Let's go to the next one. Talk with them. We find in scripture that God would come to the garden. I don't think he was coming down to check out the, uh, the, the animals. I don't think he was coming to there to check out if the trees were doing okay. He was intimately involved. The creator of the universe, intimately involved with the details of Adam and Eve. He talked with them. He gave them instructions. He said, now look, you need to, the, these plants are to eat and these plants are, and, and, and he also gave the instructions, this tree is not to eat. He gave them clear instruction on how to live their lives, even as he was intimately involved with them. And therefore, they received it from him, not from a, a lord and master from, from, from Darth Vader's screen, but rather the God who cares, the God who is involved. Dear ones, if we're going to be successful, and I might add, can I, can I expand this out? This isn't just about good parenting. This is also about good discipling. As we care for one another, as we minister to one another, as we care for our kids, and as we care for the, the congregation of the kids, if you will. They're good principles. Let's go on. Give them a sense of security. Yes, you do see that picture. Yes, it is a deer. I'll tell you about the story and then I'll make the point. Debbie's, one of her younger sisters, is an animal lover. And then some. She was driving along the road in central Pennsylvania and she happened to see a fawn laying alongside the road. Apparently the mother had been hit by a car or something, but the fawn was just there. She pulled her car over, she got a blanket out, she picked up the fawn, it was just a tiny little fawn, and put it in the back seat of her car and drove it home. She proceeded to nourish that deer with a bottle until the deer began to grow and was able to eat. She put food out for the deer and never, never tied the deer down. There was no, nothing illegal about it. Uh, it was just a genuine care for an animal that would have died otherwise. As she did that, the deer continued to grow and, and the deer would be outside and go hang out with his gang, I guess, his, his peeps. And, and, and then he'd leave his peeps and all of a sudden he'd be standing at their front door. You can see that big glass door with the wreath, standing at the front door looking in, <laughs> waiting for Janice to open the door so he could come in. He would come in and she would hug him a little bit, talk to him a little bit. She even named him. I don't remember his name. Uh, but Sweet Comfort, I think it was. Comfort boy. And, and uh, this deer, I mean, I could show you other pictures where this deer's playing with dogs. My, sis, my sister-in-law's pet dogs. Now, what's the point? God... In his person, in his mannerisms, in his interaction with us, wants us to feel secure in him. Wants us to know his touch. Wants us to know his interaction. Wants us to know the intimacy of his care. He demonstrated that to Adam and Eve. 
He modeled it that as we live in his image, we can both experience it and demonstrate it. And therein, again, part of that working towards giving them the ability, our kids, the ability to succeed. Because if they feel secure in themselves, can I, can I just do an aside for a moment? I would suggest to you that much of the gender issues that we're dealing with right now are because of people who don't know who they are in the first place. And they don't know that they're created in the image of God. They don't know that God's mark is upon them. They feel no sense of security in who they are. And the enemy is having all, excuse me, all hell breaking loose on them. We have the privilege of changing the world just by involving ourselves in some of these principles, both for our kids and for others and for others. Let's go on. Stimulate their thinking and creativity. Do you realize that God created all the animals and then told Adam to name them? Think of the brilliance of that in terms of Adam's mind. How did he come up with the names that he came up with? That's a kangaroo, and that's a giraffe, and that's a horse, and that's a pig. But even more than that, how did he remember them? I mean, there are days I'm not even sure I can remember where I'm going. And then look at Adam. God put him in a place and gave him the wherewithal to stimulate his thinking and his creativity. These pictures. The top one, my daughter, when she, when she was in first and second grade, all she wanted for lunch was cheese and bread. Every day. A, two pieces of bread and a slice of cheese, bless you. I'm like, this is crazy, kid. What are you doing this for? But that's what she wanted. And so dad got a brilliant idea. And we created what was known as mustard art. <laughs> Renee could not wait to go to lunch every day to open her sandwich to see what dad drew. <laughs> dad bombed it when he did, uh, when he did uh, the, the uh, help me hunt, SpongeBob. Think about those pants. <laughs> she said, Dad, a little too much mustard. <laughs> but it stimulated her thinking. To the point where just the other day she was talking to Debbie and she said to her, to her mom, and she said, Mom, she says, I was talking with some of my, my friends. She's now 27 and a teacher in a school. And she says, and I realized how much influence you and dad had because you always talked with us, you always interacted with us, you always challenged our thinking, you always helped us to think. My son, he was only four there. We were in uh, Puerto Rico on an AIM trip, missions trip, and Ryan was not gonna be left out of it. And he learned how to sculpt balloons. And he could make dogs and swords and you name it. Some pretty, even some more complex things. Now I must confess that what we started out with is about a month before the trip, I'd go out and buy a gross about 144 balloons. I'd blow them all up. And then Ryan and I would sit in the living room and poor Debbie had to put up with 144 animals in the house, all made of balloons, uh, as he learned the process. But it stimulated him that when we, when we got there, he couldn't wait to be part of a ministry team. Stimulate their thinking in good ways. The next one. Give them time. We've already talked about that. God came into the garden. I'm a Peanuts fan. And they, he visited with them and he spoke with them and he interacted with them. 
You know that God's available to you all the time? You make the application. If we're in the image of God. One last one. Let them take risks. Now, let me point this out. God created the garden. God took a risk because he put that tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in the middle of the garden and then said, don't eat it. He took a risk. But as we take risks with our kids, uh, we, we need to be careful how, what risks we take, of course. But we take risks with our kids. We allow them. We, we encourage them. And how many of you know that sometimes kids do things that maybe shouldn't have? Because they're guilty of being kids? How many know that adults do things they probably shouldn't because they're guilty of being human? See, God will allow us to experience risk. He will even lead us toward risk. Not temptation to cause us to fall, never. But risk to grow, to expand. 13, 13 was it? I forget. I think 13 of you going to El Salvador. First trip, how many? First trip. Oh, I wish I could go with you. I love to go with people who go on the first time. I'd love to see their world as they see it. Wish I were with you. But it's a risk. The picture you just saw, there were two of them up there. First, you will see the little one. That's my granddaughter. She's four years old. And I clipped that out of a, I, I, I photoshopped it out of, a, out of a picture of her jumping into a pool to her daddy. Daddy's standing in the pool, and you've all been there if you have little ones in a pool. Where you're like, you can do it, you can do it. Where we're encouraging them to take risk, knowing that they're secure. Knowing that we're there to help them. The other one is my 27-year-old. Now, uh, in the original picture that I had sent over, you can't see it, but if you look up at the top of that tree, right to the left, that's my daughter. She's nuts. <laughs> in fact, she was teaching in Philadelphia, just resigned her position this year at, at a school there in Philadelphia, and she's moving to Colorado living in an RV all by herself with her dog. She's nuts. Uh, and, and she's going to live out there, and she's taking a position teaching out there, and she's going to live in a, an RV full time. Why? One, because she loves to teach. First and foremost. Secondly, so she can rock climb. She's taking risks. She learned how to take risks as she was an MK, having to live around the world with her mom and dad. Let's go to the garden for a minute and let's see the risk that Eve faced. We know that when she took the risk, she failed. She ate of the fruit. So what happened? What happened when she ate? Well, how did God respond? First off, she blew it. And when she blew it, God had to respond, but it was tempered with mercy. When our kids take risks that they shouldn't have taken and they do things that they shouldn't have done, we need to correct them. But we must lead and have inherent in the process mercy. Let me, let me illustrate it. When Ryan was a little guy, he would do things that he wasn't supposed to do. And it was always clear. Uh, we always tried to live very carefully in our home. Not in a rigid way, but as God spoke in Deuteronomy 28 and said, you do this, you get blessed. You do this, you don't get blessed. Well, we tried to help our kids understand. Look, within the context of life, there are things that you can do and God will bless. There are things that you can do that mom and dad will affirm. And there are things that you shouldn't do that mom and dad are going to have to deal with or God's going to have to deal with or both. 
And so when Ryan would do that, one of the things that, that we would do, it, he, uh, as every kid does, have favorite toys at certain times in their life. And he had a favorite toy. And I would say to him, son, go get your favorite toy. And he would bring it to me. I say, son, you know what you did, right? He said, yeah, dad, I do. He said, daddy, I know what I did and I shouldn't have done it. I said, you know that there is a punishment. There's a correction. Yeah, dad, I do. Okay, now this punishment, why is it? It's because of what I did, not because you're bad. Now he didn't say that, but that's what we were instilling in him. Because we wanted to understand that when God deals with us, it's not because of anything wrong with God. And then I would say, okay, son, you're going to lose your toy for a week. And we put it up on the refrigerator where he couldn't reach it. But he could see it. You say, how cruel. No, not really. Because here's what happens. By the second day, his whole attitude, his whole demeanor, whatever it was. And, and we're not talking about something silly. We're talking about something serious in terms of disciplining. And I would say to him, okay, Ryan. I said, uh, what happened to your toy? up there. Why up there? Because I, and so on. We'd help to reinforce that. And I'd say, you know what, son? That's correction. Now I'm going to show you what mercy is. Come on, buddy. And I'd pick him up. And I'd lift him up. And I'd say, you shouldn't have this toy for another five days. But mercy says you can have it today. It brought a whole different principle to his life. Because he understood the wrongness of it, but he also still understood the forgiveness of it. You see, that's what God does with us. He will temper his, his correction with mercy. What else does he do? He makes a way out. When Eve blew it, Genesis 3, God speaking to Eve, verse 15, he says, and your seed. will step on his head and crush the serpent. The word seed there, male, singular. It was the first promise of Jesus, the Redeemer. In the judgment, even as Adam and Eve were being corrected, God was giving them a way out. And then finally, God made them clothing. They wanted to wear, wear leaves. God knew that that wouldn't work. And God made them clothing. Why? The clothing, the clothing reduced their suffering and covered their shame. It was restorative. It was rebuilding. And I wrap out with this. When all that happened, what did God do to Adam and Eve? He put them out of the garden. Why? Because of harshness? No. Because of mercy. Because God even said it. He said, if they eat of the tree of life, they will live forever in their sin. By pushing them out of the garden, it was protection, not punishment. Dear ones, if we could live that kind of a life that God demonstrates in those three chapters, your parenting skills will enhance immensely your relationship in your families will be healthy and strong. Your community will notice a difference. And we can impact the world. Now, in a, in a gathering of, of, of this sort, I, I, I recognize that there are those who are probably struggling with some issues with family and so on. And in a moment, 
I'm gonna give us opportunity to respond without trying to cause anybody to be embarrassed. What we'll do is this, uh, Pastor, if it's okay, we'll just have the prayer team come up in a, in a few moments. And then if you wanna pray for any need, but specifically, if you want to pray about family situations, whether it be your own, whether it be your kids, whether it be your kids' kids, whether it be your neighbor's kids, whatever it is, if you want to play, pray about a family situation, we'd like to pray with you. And we'd like to ask God to, to empower you and equip you and to allow his mercy and allow his, his correction as needed, where God can, maybe you, you don't know how to get more time, God can give you creative ways to find time. I wish I had the time to tell you that, I don't. No pun intended there, but reality. For 15 months, I saw my kids one week out of every five. And yet the fond memories that they have They've forgotten that I was away and remembered that I was there. God can give you creative ways to do that. Any one of these, God can give you creative insights. But it starts with being created in the image of God and born again into the image of God. If we're not born again, we have the latent image of God. It's just kind of there, like a fingerprint you can't see. But when we're born again, it becomes an active image where the Holy Spirit continues to grow it more and more and more. And so, maybe you're here this morning and you say, Danny, you know what? I know I have the latent image of God because the Bible tells me I do, but I've never been born again. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? If you've not given your life to Jesus, today would be a perfect time to do that. To say, Jesus, I need your image. Because you see, the, the challenges that you're dealing with, family or whatever, the challenges that you're dealing with, the answer is through Jesus being real in your life and through your life. And you just lift up your hand and say, Danny, will you pray for me? I just, I just want to give, give my life to Jesus. I'm going to ask the prayer team if you would come. If you would join me here, those of you that are on the prayer team. I have no idea who you are or what, and I, so I just ask for your help. But if there's something that resonated from what we've shared this morning, that you say, man, I just need God to do something. I'm going to pray, and then after we pray, uh, Pastor, after I pray, I'll turn it over to you, and then if they want to, however you want to do it, for them to respond to the prayer team, okay? Jesus, thank you for your mercy, your care, your provision, your power, your reign and authority in our lives. I pray for families, God. I pray if there are any that are estranged here from their kids, from their parents, God, would you by grace move in and do new things, reestablish relationships, heal hurts, bring forgiveness, bring release. In Jesus' name.